Listeners, welcome back to the podcast. Today, we have Ryan Zurer from Vine Ventures, a venture capital fund that is taking a fairly unique approach to the psychedelic space. And we brought him on the podcast today to hear a little bit more about his story, about why he started Vine Ventures, about uh, Ryan's philosophy while investing in the psychedelic space and anything and everything that we want to drop in about. So Ryan, thanks for joining us on the pod. Cool. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. For sure. Where are you calling in from today? Uh, today I am in Toronto, locked down Toronto, Ontario. Is that home base for you? Uh, no, I actually spend most of my time in Switzerland. Wow. Where are you originally from? Uh, originally from Canada. Okay. Okay. And what yeah. brought you to Switzerland then? Um, crypto originally. I started putting crypto projects in Switzerland, in Zug, Switzerland pretty early on, um, kind of 2014 to 15 period. Um, it just is, you know, Switzerland is great because if you want coherent, forward-looking regulation in almost any industry, and I think you're also going to see it in, in psychedelics, look to what the Swiss are doing. Um, and then obviously taxes are, are extremely favorable and, and you've got just a threshold of, of, of a talent and um, educated people doing doing great things, so it's it's a great hotbed for um, for building and innovating in a in a variety of spaces and quiet and just a nice place to live. Beautiful nature and mountains all over yeah. the place, and you can yeah. go hiking yeah. and yeah, great food and all the things. I, I yeah. was in Switzerland maybe for a week, twenty sixteen or twenty seventeen, and had a chance to see that country. I spent a lot of time in Germany as well. There's something about Europe that at least for someone who's been born in the States and spent a lot of time living in big cities, Europe is really good for the soul. It has beautiful architecture. It's quiet. It's comfortable. Things seem to just make a little bit more sense over there than, than in North America. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it, it, it varies greatly depending on, on the place in Europe, but certainly, sure. certainly Switzerland checks those boxes for sure. For sure, for sure. So you're you're moved to Switzerland in 2014. Super involved with crypto. Where then do psychedelics fall into the mix? Where do those start for you? Yeah. So um, I actually met my wife at her um, ayahuasca center in Peru um, a number of years ago, and uh, you know she ran Pulse and owned and operated the Pulse Tours ayahuasca center in um, in the, just outside of Iquitos, Peru. And, you know, have spent enough time with her in, in her ceremonies. She, she does a lot of San Pedro ceremonies as well, uh, that I've been able to conduct my own sort of informal, um, empirical study of how much like the catalytic force of psychedelics can drive meaningful, um, durable change for people. Uh, it, 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 it certainly hit home for me. To, to, to accompany a friend who uh, at the time was was kind of on on like last options uh, with respect to pretty debilitating addiction and and to watch him kind of come through that and is, you know now in the, I think five years um, sober from that catalytic experience it, it created a moment where you're like wait a sec like something's here like there's you know there's a there's an efficacy that is here that that can't be denied and um and so over the years you know i've probably uh accompanied in some way or form somewhere in the hundreds of ceremonies of, of, of people going through these processes and and you just hear the same consistency in in the stories of uh of how clear-minded they come out of it with respect to challenges that they went into it uh, of the ability to to deal with trauma and and so on and so forth, and so you know I'm a venture capitalist and and have been for for a long time. And fundamentally, I believe that venture capital, when applied correctly, seeks to create and then accrue value from solving big problems. And there is no larger problem that for my money on the planet today than the mental health crisis. This shadow pandemic, or in fact, the real pandemic, is the mental health crisis that we've unleashed onto our society. Um, and that was a problem before COVID. And then obviously COVID um, added rocket fuel to, 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 to that issue. And so uh, in about 2018, I started um, poking around the space. Uh, I noticed 
uh, very early on that a lot of the best work uh, was being led by nonprofits. And then when I would talk with people at conferences or, or, or calls to startups up, they, you know, they would often be very standoffish once they knew that I was a venture capitalist. There was a certain aversion to, you know, the capitalists of the space, so to speak. Um, and so a lot of the first checks I wrote were philanthropic checks and, uh, and, you know, a lot of the most productive checks that, that I've written thus far are some of those, those philanthropic checks. I'm, you know, a huge fan of the, the work that Maps and USONA and the McKenna Foundation, who I actually just had a call with, um, and some of the academics in the space are, uh, are leading. Um, but then from there, you know, I really wanted to walk the talk in, in, in this space. And I noticed that entrepreneurs were struggling with this, this balance between wanting to be mission driven and values aligned and in, in it for the right reasons to help heal people and heal the world, but then also looking for sustainability in their business models and, you know, and, and not wanting to just be a, a not-for-profit, which is in a never-ending cycle of fundraising. Um, and so the way that we structured Vine, which to my knowledge is, is a novel um, venture capital structure, whereby we take fully half of the profits of the management company and deploy that back into the industry in nonprofit projects, you know, has been really interesting. Uh, I dramatically underestimated the effect that that would have for deal flow and for um, excitement around entrepreneurs. And it's because the, the Vine reciprocity pledge is portfolio entrepreneur directed. So it's not, it's not me that gets to, to dole this money out into the, 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 the projects and issues that I find compelling. It's the portfolio of entrepreneurs that get to decide where this money goes. They, you know, we'll all sit around a table and we've actually already had a couple of, of these meetings and been, been fortunate enough that Vines had some exits and we've been already been able to write some, um, some checks in this regard. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs either want to know that a good chunk of the, the value that they're creating will go back to nonprofit projects in the space or, or, and, or I should say they, you know, they have designs on being capital allocators themselves. Uh, and so this is an opportunity to be a capital allocator and think through, you know, how to deploy capital in a, in a um, in an effective manner. So essentially just to make sure I'm understanding this and tracking this correctly, you have, let's say 20 to 25 portfolio companies that you've already invested in. And as you're determining, mm -hmm. Let's say from this point forward, which companies you want to invest in, that's not only up to you, but more so it's up to the CEOs of the companies that you've already invested in. I know. So, so, so let me, uh, let me back this up. So there is the, the, the portfolio of, of companies, and that is decided by, by me. I'm a venture capitalist. I've been doing this for a long time. And so we make the investments. Okay. But then of the 25 companies that exist in the fund, at the end of, you know, at the end of the life cycle of the fund, which is scheduled to be seven years, but in reality will be much shorter because the timeline to liquidity generally in venture has shortened. Um, but also this novel industry, we're seeing shorter timelines to, to liquidity. And that's just because we build on the shoulders of giants and so on and so forth. So at the end of the seven years, let's say, uh, or earlier, all of the entrepreneurs in the fund, the sort of 25 entrepreneurs that make up the fund will sit around the table and say, okay, we've got X millions to dole out. You know, this many will go into research, and this this many will go into indigenous projects, and this many will go into to say education and and so on and so forth. You know, who becomes a portfolio entrepreneur? That's you know that that's the part of my job that I actually enjoy the most, uh, which is connecting with entrepreneurs, finding great people that I'm I'm you know super excited to to work with. And then working with them in 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 hopes of building a, a valuable company that that um, that matters to to a billion people. And so, how have you made those decisions so far? What are some of the example companies that you've invested in, and why have you chosen uh, those specific companies in the psychedelic space? Cool. So, in psychedelics, there are four criteria that that I look for, and that's because of how unique this space is, and also because 
I'm coming at this from the perspective of, of really wanting to make meaningful change in the world. You know, I, it, the money involved in this fund, it's a $25 million fund. Like this isn't going to change my life. I'm in this for actually the end goal of uh, if anyone in the world who wants access to psychedelic therapies, either for curing the sick or yes, it's okay for betterment of the well, they can get access to that. I think the world would be fundamentally a better place. And so whether I'm a little bit richer, a little bit poorer, makes no difference in comparison to how much better the world would be if we've got if we've got got that kind of setup. The investment process and thesis around Vine is a little bit different than than what I've done in the past. You know, fundamentally we start with looking for uh, entrepreneurs who are just good people doing this, you know, for the right reasons because they're the ones who are going to have longevity. They're going to be doing it when it's hard. They're going to be doing it at night. They're going to be doing it when it's not the hottest thing in investments, uh, they'll, they'll have that durability as, as entrepreneurs. And truthfully, you know, I just resonate more with, with, you know, with people who, who, who see this more as a mission that we can all work on together rather than a a get rich quick scheme. Um, secondly, and probably most importantly, we look for, do these entrepreneurs, does this team have the technical skills to pull off what they're pulling off? Um, I will write a check to five medical chemists working on, you know, fundamental breakthroughs every single time over a check to five MBAs who are building slide decks and, and trying to raise more money on more money. I like supporting really technical founders who are building a specific piece of technology and that specific piece of technology should be defensible. Um, and that's the third thing is, is, is there defensibility in this? And just to be clear, and we can dive into this, defensibility should not come through a patent. Patent laws are grossly outdated, um, not, frankly, not relevant at this point. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll dive further into this. And then the fourth thing that we look for is, can this touch a billion people's lives? You know, I'm not that interested in, in certain business models. So for example, because my wife was an early entrepreneur in psychedelic tourism, I'm not interested in psychedelic tourism uh, startups. You know, they're great. They're great for education. They're great for building awareness. They're great for a lot of things and they provide a lot of healing, but they're not scalable. Uh, They're hugely capital intensive, finicky business models. You know, at at the end of the day, they're a travel, uh, they're a hotel. And I owned a hotel in Brazil before and it's a racket, to be honest with you. Like you could provide the greatest healing imaginable, but if the, the soap in the bathroom is the wrong scent, you're going to get three stars on booking.com and then you got to deal with that. And so there are, are specific businesses that are scalable that we look for here. And those are the four criteria. It's pretty simple. Like the, the, the playbook is, is not rocket science. The difficulty comes in this space in that the hit rate is very low. So like the rate of investable assets and the rate of entrepreneurs that have the technical skill set to pull things off is really, really low. And that is just an indication of the maturity of the space. We're prehistoric. We're pre me of the curve. Um, and, uh, and it's not yet set how the future will unfold, whether it will be this hyper-medicalization or whether our thesis will unfold where we think that, that um, use cases for betterment of the well will flourish, that naturals will be an, an expressive part of the demand profile, um, and that, that liberalization will come faster than people think. And that's where we're aligned as well. I've, I've often been speaking out through the yeah. podcast or other sort of platforms as well, just very skeptical of the FDA medicalization process. And the core reason that I come back to is uh, the FDA and sort of that centralized approach is very much a, 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 a relic of industrialism and, and nation states. And mm-hmm. with psychedelics coming onto the scenes in the 60s, inspiring the computer revolution, which thus inspired the internet, blockchain, crypto, more or less the, the, the further decentralization of power, um, we're now reaching this sort of tipping point where um, it looks as if in the psychedelic space as well, decrim and state-by-state legalization will likely outpace the overly centralized approach of FDA medicalization. One, because 
we now haven't done any research or clinical trials in the past year for FDA because of COVID. And mm-hmm. I think too, I just always, as an entrepreneur, look at this concept of attractor points, right? So when Jobs and Bill Gates invented Apple and Microsoft, they saw in the future, okay, there's this attractor point of the full digitization of society. And I think the attractor point that we're headed is basically decentralization You know, um, with what Tesla is building. They're building a massive plan to redistribute energy uh, so that it's less centralized with what Bitcoin is building. They're looking to you know, redistribute finance to make it you know, a lot more decentralized. And I think with psychedelics, what psychedelics do is they decentralize medicine. They, they help individuals understand what it is that people need that's best for them. And they're supported and mirrored by therapists, doctors, and whatnot, but it's much less prescriptive and sort of top down than the typical uh, healthcare model that most people exist in today. Yeah, I mean, this is a feature that that I would love to see it, uh, of uh, of kind of decentralized access to uh, guided psychedelic therapies. Our data shows that there's approximately four thousand. Uh, underground psychedelic therapists in continental North America, which it, the first time we came across this number was shocking to me. When you think about it, what bothers me so much about, say, the you know the model that that Compass is trying to force feed in the U.S. is that it fails to recognize the professionalism and care and place that these therapists have in the value chain. That this is actually a really important component, and that if, if we can. If we can set it up such that people can have, you know, the accompaniment of a therapist and not be only accompanied by a medical doctor who, by the way, is not trained in therapy and, uh, and, and really a medical doctor should probably not spend five, six, seven hours with a single patient, you know, accompanying them through their, through, through their trauma. Um, you know, if we, if we can have this, this more egalitarian, decentralized, liberalized approach to, uh, to, to, to psychedelic therapies. I think it's going to be better for patients and better for, for the world. We'll see a thousand flowers bloom in the, the, the place of a long shadow of, of a hyper-medicalized, um, you know, patent-controlled system, which, which I fundamentally disagree with. And I think you disagree with it both on a philosophical, but also a business level, which is why you're making the investments that you're making. What is it, how is it that you see the space rolling out in the next three to five to seven years, in particular, you know, with the investments that you made in SciGen, which is creating mm-hmm. the actual substances, what's your take on sort of patent plays versus just generics versus just people getting grow kits and growing their own mushrooms at home? The core to our thesis is that uh, liberalization will come for you know curing the sick primarily to start, but very very quickly after. We will recognize that that recreation is not a danger to society, and use cases around betterment of the well will flourish much faster than 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 we think today collectively as as an industry. The other part component to to the thesis is that naturals will be a significant part of the demand profile. A lot of people in the space think that it will be all synthetic, one hundred percent synthetic, patent controlled. That is patently absurd first and second dystopian future in my view if the only way that i could get access to say like mushrooms or ayahuasca is this poor uh analog this 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 half-baked um synthetic version uh versus the actual real stuff it, it, it you know i don't think that 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 people will have strong demand for a uh, synthetics the way that today you know, if we look at the demand profile across cannabis, uh, you know, I like to draw the allegory of cannabis from time to time. There was all this money put into, you know, synthetics uh, into cannabis and people are primarily still smoking flour. You know, that's still the, a huge part of the demand for profile. And so um, the recreational folks will have strong demand for the, for the naturals. And then even in the case of, of not like purely naturals, we'll see, we will see the learning curve get to the point where we'll have GMP production of natural substances, but with GMP level quality and consistency. That was really the big bet on SciGen is that these guys can get to GMP level quality for MDMA, um, synthetic psilocybin and LSD today. 
And they're developing a, a, a portfolio to be able to do that for a wider range of natural and synthetic uh, uh, psychedelics over time. And I think that that, you know, that fundamentally fits into the industry independent of how the future unfolds with respect to the patent race. And then obviously, you know, you and I both agree uh, very strongly with, with, with Tim Ferriss's view that generics will likely flourish and that a lot of the patents that, that um, are being attempted right now are either attempts at, at patenting, um, you know, something, repatenting something that was already patented in the 70s and expired in the 90s, or patenting a molecule that's existed naturally for thousands of years, which, you know, obviously is not defensible. And, uh, and I, think, I think time will show that. And again, that's great because instead of having a single company dominate all the value in the space, we have a thousand flowers bloom and entrepreneurs can, can be active all up, all up and down the value chain, which I as a venture capitalist find much more compelling. And not only compelling, but much more resilient. Right? I always think yeah, of Taleb's concept sure. of anti-fragility, right? If you're looking to create an entire ecosystem, an entire movement, better to have all of, like you said, the thousand flowers bloom because that's much more anti-file as a system than you know, having a few unicorns who just totally take off but end up trying to monopolize the whole thing because especially as it relates to psychedelic medicine, that just really fucks, fucks shit up uh, from yeah. being blunt. Yeah. No, uh, absolutely. And I mean, decentralization will matter. Regionalism will matter. We back Saijin in part because Saijin attends the, what we call the, the, the cacao markets. So I'm firmly of the belief that the markets that will uh, open up and liberalize first will be Canada, California, Colorado, and Oregon. Uh, and we call these the cacao markets. These markets are going to open up, but they're not going to open up to like producers from France to immediately import into them, right? Like regionalism will matter. And that's why thinking about this in a decentralized approach, you know, where again, a thousand flowers can bloom, I think is, is the path forward here and, and, and will be how the future unfolds. It may, it may not be how the future unfolds, but it's the future that I want to work towards. So I wake up every day and I work towards that future because I find that more inspiring, more compelling than, um, than this, you know, dystopian view of, of, uh, like psychedelic therapies being only controlled by a doctor in a hospital with a white lab coat. And you have to pay $8,000 a dose for the synthetic version of, you know, of what you can find naturally in, in the Amazon forest. Um, that seems like, you know, absolute nonsense to me. Yeah. And it feels like that may, you know, like I think of my parents, I'm from Michigan, the Midwest, you know, if, if my mom or dad, they're in their mid sixties now, if they wanted to go in and do a psychedelic, they might feel better if it was prescribed by a medical professional, but a, that doesn't mean that they would want to do it within a very um, clinical setting. And B, that doesn't mean that after they have that first experience, that's sort of certified by a medical prof professional that they wouldn't want to do it otherwise or elsewhere at a retreat yeah. or with friends or whatever it might be. So I think it feels like with the medicalization, like that's a great first line of defense. It's a great tool to have in the toolkit. It feels like insurance will cover it sooner rather than later. And, you know, it's still more inaccessible. It's not necessarily an ideal experience as you and I both probably understand from our years of experience. Like it's usually best to do this in groups as well, not just individually sure. by yourself with a couple therapists, right? It's nice to have that connection. It's nice to have the retreat. It's nice to be in nature. I, you know, everything that we built with yeah. synthesis was having that in mind, right? What is the future of these ceremonial spaces and how um, how can we bring community and folks together to, to heal one another? So that all feels very central. And, you know, Matt Johnson had a tweet the other day, which was something along the lines of, you know, a lot of people are skeptical of the clinical approach for a lot of the reasons that you just mentioned. And, and what I responded with was, well, instead of saying psychedelics can't be used in a clinical environment, what if we just reimagined the clinical environment itself? Where like what they're building in Oregon right now, you know, if, if, if you have a licensure, like Synthesis can host psilocybin retreats in Oregon, as long as they have the license to do it. So it doesn't necessarily, and, and they can have people who have depression, who are clinically depressed, come to those experiences and come to those retreats. So I think that's where, you know, these worlds mix and match is, um, you know, like the psychedelics will be, will need to be used for healing, but like so much of that healing can be done 
from like a collective interconnected perspective. Absolutely. I really like the movements that we've seen in Oregon. And, and this is the thing, you know, you've been in this industry for, for a long time. If we would have backed up, say, 24 months ago, 36 months ago, and I would have come along and I would have told you, hey, by 24 months from now, you know, three states would have uh, decrim uh, approved uh, and Canada would be uh, treating patients not only for palliative care on, uh, you know, on one-off authorizations, but not only for palliative care, but now also for, for non-palliative use ca- cases, uh, specifically uh, PTSD and depression. You know, that probably would have seemed unimaginable. But when you look at this trajectory, it's absolutely undeniable where we're going at this point. I think, you know, um, very clearly by the time America gets around to, to its next election cycle, the presidential election cycle, uh, you'll probably see somewhere north of a dozen states with a decrim ballot as part of that cycle. And, and at that point, you know, the door, the door is opening much faster than, than, than most people realize in part because of the path that's already been paved by cannabis. It has changed the perspective for both society at large and regulators specifically um, to, to be able to say, hey, that which was prohibited maybe didn't need to be so. And our fears around like, you know, society descending into chaos in the streets if we, if, you know, if, if we allow what, what, you know, what we consider to be, to be drugs, but other people consider to be medicine, it, you know, a, a allow a path towards access, um, it, it doesn't create negative societal change. In fact, it creates a, by and large, um, a positive societal change. You know, around Canada, the the perspective of of the change that that the cannabis industry has has brought has been largely positive, and that's why the regulatory movement is moving so fast. Because you get you get pressure from both sides of the aisle. Liberals see this as a um, as an important tool for dealing with the the massive mental health crisis in our society. And conservatives see this as a as a, as another compelling industry that that can produce important tax revenues and and fund uh, and fund projects. You know, British Columbia has dramatically decreased the cost of its or or the price of its uh, school tax because of the taxes that it receives from cannabis. There's real change for uh, d- independent of, uh, of what your perspective is here. So we touched on this at the beginning of the interview. You know, you you started with crypto and Bitcoin and and blockchain, right? That's that's mm-hmm. why you had moved to Switzerland in 2014. You know, that that has grown now into Vine Ventures. You've supported, you know, a couple dozen companies through your venture fund and you have a very, I would say, unique thesis and perspective on how it's going to roll out. How do those two worlds come together? How does how does crypto meet sort of the psychedelic space and what does specifically Bitcoin or cryptocurrency what what technology is there that helps your vision to be that much more likely to come true? This is really interesting. I find myself in this conversation quite frequently that the the Venn diagram of crossover between crypto and psychedelics is, you know, there's a lot more overlap than one would think. Typically, and when I started, when I made the decision to get into to, to psychedelic investing. Uh, you know, I created Vine to have distinct separation of church and state between my family office dialectic, which does my crypto investing, and Vine, which is specifically, you know, psychedelics and, and conscious health and wellness. But, you know, I confess there's a huge percentage of, of, of our LP base who, who made their money in crypto. Um, almost well over half, I'd say close to two thirds of, of the entrepreneurs that, that we talk with have some, you know, uh, uh, some connection to crypto themselves, or there's a lot of overlap. We see this, you know, people asking about payments. We see, for example, our portfolio company, which we're super excited about, um, Trip, led by the, you know, the amazing entrepreneur, uh, Nanea Reeves. You know, I think you'll see probably something with respect to, to crypto crossover with her um, VR app over, over the next little while. And 
it's something that I have been trying to like to to deny or to force to be mutually exclusive for myself because like like ah no you got to you know focus on one what one is like bioscience and 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 other things and, and you know crypto is you know programmable money like what kind of crossover do they have and it, it it's just like it's an undeniable force that there's just this overlap between the two and there's this connection between the two in part because they're 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 novel emerging industries that have emerged in the last you know kind of five six seven years depending on on um, when you want to strike the timeline with the academic renaissance with psychedelics and and obviously you know the growth of crypto when you kind of chart the knee of the curve on that one and I'm finding myself today more and more open to entrepreneurs that that are discussing you know, kind of commingled uh, opportunities, whether it's, you know, whether it's payments or whether it's using NFTs in novel ways to support trips uh, or whether it's like data platforms and things like that. I think you are going to see a lot of crossover. And then, you know, also what you're continuing to see, and I, and I hope that, that this grows more. And in fact, I would love to exchange some ideas with you on, on, on how to, um, how to promote this is, we're starting to see a lot of crypto wealth go into psychedelic research. And that's important. You know, I, look, we're still very early in, in, in the, the, the research trajectory. There's a lot of projects that, that need to be funded, highly capital intensive for better, for worse. We could get into, you know, we could talk all day about the inefficiencies of the university system. And I myself try to shy away from university philanthropy and, and try to find and fund private researchers and in, instead of university backed researchers, because it's just such a mess with, with schools. But um, we are seeing a lot of, of, of not-for-profit capital flow into psychedelics from crypto, which is also good. Um, and so I fought the fight of trying to keep them separate for, you know, years. And I kind of have thrown up my hands at this point and it just accepted that, you know, there's just a lot of love between the two spaces. Well, and that's, you know the the deeper implications is probably a whole podcast in itself between cryptocurrency and network states and and new city states and sort of the relocalization of governance and I mean going back to Switzerland as a model you know Switzerland has cantons and then the cantons have quite a lot of agency as it relates to you know the oh, larger nation I, state right I, absolutely I mean it is the model for decentralized governance and you see this play out for example we've seen a play out with COVID where every Canton, every city state will have its own policy and, and they have their, it's their own tax policy. And it's interesting that because you get closer to the ground on issues, you get more thoughtful, personalized decisions. Uh, this goes back to, to what I'm talking about with respect to, to you know, respecting the, the underground therapists. You know, when you get support that's close to the ground, that's individualized, that's you know, localized in your community, regionally, a tune, you you generally get better outcomes, and so you know we see this in decentralized governance in in crypto, where the the people who are are deepest in the weeds in projects are the ones who should be making the decisions, and they're the ones who are most active in governance quite often. And you usually you'll kind of like delegate into like a liquid governance in in this way, um, and. I would like to see the same type of thing happen in psychedelics. But again, it requires us to recognize that the FDA path is neither the only path to success, nor is it a foregone conclusion, right? That, that we need to think about other things like religious exemptions and, uh, you know, decrim liberalization and, you know, war on drugs questions and whether, you know, whether any drug should be illegal and, 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 and so on and so forth. We need to think about, about naturals and about local cultivation and, and these types of things. You know, now we're starting to see entrepreneurs look at it in this way. Like, I think the, the, the Rubicon has been crossed with respect to the obvious power of decentralized technologies. Certainly, if COVID has done anything to bring us into the future, 
it's brought us into that future. We're recognizing the importance of um, of decentralization uh, at times. And so I'm starting to get really excited when I'm seeing pitch books and, and entrepreneurs talking about, about how to solve the, the problem of access to psychedelics in this manner, recognizing, uh, you know, decentralized models, whether it's through a decentralized network of churches or, or whatever, um, uh, and, and kind of close to the ground decisions, localized decisions being the ones that win out, uh, rather than, you know, some faceless person in a, in a capital making, making a decision that affects people that they don't understand. Yeah. That sense of being held and supported, right. That, that personalized interactions. Um, we're building this out with third wave where we're going public with a directory fairly soon of retreats, clinics, therapists, coaches, where we're essentially saying, okay, right. Like we built out all the education. Now, a lot of folks are asking, okay, now that I know about psychedelics, well, where do I go find a trusted provider? And so if you're in Oakland, that's different than if you're in Vancouver, which is different than if you're in New York, which is different than you're in Amsterdam. So essentially, yep. you know, one question that I've continued to come back to is if, if psychedelics, if the integration of psychedelics are to be successful, particularly outside of the peer clinical framework, what technology, mm-hmm. what education, what platforms need to be built to ensure that it's successful. And the thing that I keep coming back to is it's psychedelic literacy. It's, it's like if we had a whole country that didn't know how to cook or didn't know how to write or didn't know how to read, right? We have a whole mm-hmm. basically globe that really doesn't understand psychedelics whatsoever. And it's just starting yeah. that path. So yeah. how and, do you and like then, and then develop half the that country, skill? And then half the country thinks that like books are insanely dangerous because somebody yeah. told them when they were six years old that books were dangerous, right? It's like, wow, you know, imagine... So that's the part that we're that we're starting with with reeducation, and that's why you know I have to say the third wave itself is amazing, and I'm we're super grateful for the very important work that you do in in this space. Um, the you know the number of people who have gone through your psychedelic guides and made a first choice of like what's best for them, you know whether it's salvia or peyote or mescaline or or, or, or whatever else, or people who have thought about microdosing and, and heard about microdosing, especially in, in kind of the, the cult bubble that is, is Silicon Valley and have referenced your, your guides on, on microdosing. This is, this is really, really important stuff. And so, so kudos to you and, 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 and very grateful for, for the work because obviously this didn't, wasn't built overnight, right? You've been, yeah. it's been many years to, to develop this stuff, aggregate the, um, aggregate the information and 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 so on and so forth. So actually, on that point, yeah, where do you want to take you know thirdwave.co? Like what? Like what is you know what is the, the the like the grand vision of 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 what it can be and and where do you want to build it next? Yeah, I really see it as like the golden goose, so to say, right? Like like in 2018, we spent off synthesis from Third Wave, sent out a few emails to our list. Yeah. Um, and had something. We'll roll out a CPG line pretty soon that we haven't announced totally publicly yet, but it'll be microdosing supplements, prep integration boxes. We can roll that off. So Third Wave, it's a brand, it's a community. And really, like I want that to continue to maintain its sort of hegemony as the trusted public platform in the psychedelic space. You have a question about psychedelics, go to Third Wave. You need to find a provider, go to Third Wave. You want to find a coach who can help you out with X, Y, and Z, go to Third Wave, right? Just start there. It's that front door into psychedelics. And the, the, the way that we're navigating then is, I come back to this phrase, uh, community-led platform. There's this guy I follow on Twitter. His name is Greg Eisenberg. He built this app called Islands that he sold to WeWork. He's built a few other community-led platforms. And so I love that idea is we've taken the opposite approach of most companies in the space and most businesses in general, because we built the audience and the community and the brand first. And we basically said, hey, we're going to figure this out together as we see where the psychedelic space lands. And so what we've continued to focus on is trust within that, because trust is central to it, creating stuff that actually helps people. And then looking at as more opportunities in the space arise, like as microdosing supplements become a thing, as grow kits become a thing, well, we can easily spin that off because we have the community to support and amplify and elevate that. Um, so what I see it becoming is really third wave 
will be that sort of main island of the psychedelic archipelago. And mm-hmm. then we'll continue to spin off other sub-entities from that because the trust is there with the platform and the brand. And then as things become more feasible, we can simply um, spin up new things. So that's more or less where I've landed. I think training and education are key and central to that. Um, and generally, like providing a framework outside of clinics for folks to learn about, f- find and book experiences, and then feel supported you know, with our membership site and community as they're going through this. Cool. Yeah. Have you had a surge in in uh, in visits to the to the website? Because I imagine like people like all scared about the third wave of COVID, like go on Google and type in <laughs> third wave, and then find, you know f- maybe find their way here and find find better solutions for for conscious health and wellness rather than than rather than, than psychedelics dying. or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Right. Well, so, that's we'll, that's an interesting part of the approach, right? It's like we've been very psychedelic focused, so how do we like clearly there's something to psychedelics themselves, but these are also relevant to so many other areas, right? As people are yeah. searching for mental health solutions, as people are searching for, you know, think outside the box solution, creative solutions, right? What I love about psychedelics is it's not so much about the mushroom or the ayahuasca or whatever it is, it's much more about how all of the entities and organization and infrastructure that we're building, how psychedelic, like the, how it has that psychedelic component. And I, and I think what I consider to be the psychedelic component is really the interconnected component. So all of a sudden, how are we bringing interconnectedness into commerce, into business, into education, into relationships, into everything, right? I love Charles Eisenstein and his philosophy of story of separation to story of interconnectedness and how are psychedelics helping to birth this new model, right? I love Buckminster Fuller's quote about, don't fight the old model, just build a new model that makes the old one obsolete. And I think that is the opportunity that we have with sort of the convergence of psychedelics, crypto, blockchain, all these technologies of decentralization are this new sort of emergent interconnected model that will ideally help humanity to um, you know, overcome its current existential crisis, if you will. Yeah. Actually, this brings me to a, que- uh, uh, to a question that I, that I ask a lot of, say, OGs in the space like, like, like yourself. So the way that I look at it is, you know, I, I mentioned at the top the catalytic moment of psychedelics, because for me, you know, a, a psychedelic therapy can be this catalytic moment that then sets somebody off on a journey of exploring novel modalities of health and wellness. And what what you see next very frequently, and again, you know, my own sort of uh, like pseudo empirical informal study of this has been from that catalytic moment, people often will find mindfulness and that's potentially meditation, but it's potentially other things. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll start to think more deeply about biohacking, about uh, alternative diets. And, and you have these movements that are, count in the tens of millions of people, you know, of which psychedelics is, again, a, an important catalytic component, but not the whole thing itself. And I've been searching around for um, a name to call the general category, because this is like the general category of the investment space that we occupy. That yes, you know, psychedelics is an important part, but it also includes, you know, biohacking and quantified self and, and uh, you know, a big part of the demand side will come from, from communities like the California sober movement and the, you know, and, and. Burning Man culture and um, you know biohackers generally and 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 people who are searching for novel churches and there's a huge community here in Toronto around Inward, which is this almost religious like you know community around hot cold therapies combined with uh, with breath work. So you you know and and what that can mean for people you know, either recovering from, from things or, uh, or just looking for new, uh, healthy entertainment options that aren't going to the bar, right. That they can be in a community and, and have a social event on say a Friday night. Cause incidentally 
tonight I, I'll go over to Inward and, and, and be with some people there. Tell Robbie uh, I say hi. Yeah, well, we'll do. <laughs> Love that. Um, and, and so this whole category, um, I've been kind of searching for a name. The name that we typically use internally has been conscious health and wellness that encompasses all these things. But we've also heard trans tech in the past. And I'm wondering if you have a name for this, you know, for this general category that, that includes psychedelics, but is not limited to only psychedelics. It's kind of more about these new modalities of health and wellness. I have a few different that I'll share with you. One could be the, um, the yoga bourgeoisie movement. <laughs> Um, you know, these, these sort of yuppies who are, who have the wealth, who are getting into mindfulness, who see it as sort of the next trend and the next thing, but don't necessarily go as deep as they could into the shadow side and the healing and the trauma. Right. But there's still definitely that movement of the, the yoga bourgeoisie. Another way that I think about it, and this is much more personal to even my experience. When I first started dropping acid, I was 19. I'm 30 now. So about 11 years ago, I was starting to do LSD and psilocybin mushrooms and in higher doses. And the experiences that I would have in those, um, in those moments, in those many hours, was an experience of a total freedom, and then b coming to an awareness of how do I need to integrate this to have more and more freedom in my everyday life. And what I landed on of with one component of that was the more that I can sort of rewild myself, the more that I can strip off the conditioning of modernity. And like allow myself to be fully free in what it means to be a homo sapien and a human, right? So I love... So that's when I started to get into CrossFit and paleo and functional fitness and even meditation and mindfulness Mm -hmm. and spending time in the woods and everything that I've even built through Third Wave, right? The framework that I've seen things through is how are we marrying the ancient wisdom of our biology and how fundamentally true that is with the accessibility to cutting edge technologies like hot, cold thermogenesis and breath work or neurofeedback or things related to the quantified self movement, right? So it's really this beautiful marriage of this ancient wisdom that's been baked into our DNA, right? The rewilding aspect and element, which we see a lot in sort of the Austin, Texas scene, you know, where people are now going, you know, taking mushrooms and going hunting on three-day excursions, then bringing it back and starting homesteads and, you know, all that, all those sorts of things. Um, but we're also seeing it, like you said, in many, many other areas where folks, after they have these opening experiences, these catalytic experiences with psychedelics, they are looking to feel that sense of connection. Right. So anything that helps them to get back to that sense of connection, whether it's meditation, whether it's time outdoors, oftentimes it's a specific diet, because as probably you and you you know just as well as I do, when you clean up the diet, all of the noise drops away. And I think what many of us are attempting to get back to is where is the signal? We've collectively lost the signal as a species Mm -hmm. because there's Mm -hmm. been so much distraction. So the more that we can strip away, the more that we can decondition, the easier it is to tune into that signal, which some people would call truth. Some people would call God. Some people would call a mystical experience, whatever you want to call it. And then how are we building in practices afterwards to continue to revisit and sort of dip from that well, knowing that we can't just you know, blast our face off with five grams of mushrooms once a week. You have to sort of space that out a little bit. So I don't, I don't know if I've landed on a specific phrase. I think there are a few things that I hear tossed around, but it has something to do with that marriage of ancient biology and the truth of who we are with the ability to leverage cutting edge technologies to essentially facilitate enlightenment on demand. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of this almost ancient future medicine right both 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 ancient and futuristic at the same time and a and a strange paradox but yeah i resonate definitely with everything that you're saying here on an individual level the ability to hold that complexity of the both and the both ancient and future the both whatever and why it's it's being able to hold the tension in between that that i think is that stage of integral development so to say. Yeah. I think that's what a lot of folks are using these catalytic experiences for, is for growth, development, and maturity so they can essentially see things from an integrated perspective, right? That interconnected perspective. Yeah. It's kind of like the, this concept that I, that I call the, the, the quantum state of being, 
where you, mm. you recognize the genius of and between what are otherwise, you know, two opposite states, like two binary or, or, or seemingly binary issues. So for example, like people, you know, will look at stoicism or Epicureanism. And really it's not, it's not about being stoic or being uh, Epicurean. It, it's about the, the ebb and flow between these two states so that you can be both, you know, zero and one and one and zero and one and one and zero and zero, right? Like, like you know, quantum machines. That's kind of this quantum state of being that, that people find, you know, again, through the catalytic moment of, of a psychedelic journey. Ryan, it's been a pleasure. In terms of awesome. more information, I know you guys have a pretty basic website up, right? Vine.vc. Any other resources, recommendations for our audience as we, as we go um, off today? Well, I mean, we're hiring very, very aggressively. So, so reach okay. out, uh, our, RZ at vine.vc, um, to me, or we do keep a really deep, comprehensive database of all the companies and all the, the foundations and, uh, in the entire space. We intend to publish, uh, our updated version. We, we kind of do it once a quarter and it's been an internal mm-hmm. thing. We've decided to open source it and, and, and publish it. And so we will publish this with a revamp of our website in the next couple of months. So stay tuned for that. Um, there's a couple of blog posts and, and, you know, from time to time, I'll tweet about things. Um, and then, uh, you know, get out and, and, and try, I, I encourage people to, you know, we often say to portfolio companies that we're from St. Louis on these things. Like we want to try it. We want to like, you know, show me, uh, like, Hey, if you've got something interesting, for example, like I'm super excited to try your, your, your microdose package. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and some of these CPG, uh, things that you have, I think, I think that, that that's going to be awesome and would encourage people to, to try as many different things. So for example, um, go home and I, instead of doing a, a straight normal meditation today, try, uh, try a trip on trip. Uh, that's trip with two piece, um, on, on Oculus. And so, uh, you can, you can find lots of ways to interact with our portfolio. Sweet. And we'll include some of those links in the show notes, Ryan, it's been a cool. pleasure and an honor. Thank awesome. you. Thank you for taking the time today, dude. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit the third wave dot where you'll find plenty of free resources on intentional and responsible psychedelic use.